<clears throat> uh, we all spent time with Sybil. Um, this is the way I remember her, remembering Sybil Goldstein. Roses are cadmium red, violets are cerulean blue. On a good day, that's all you really need. Pablo Picasso had fat little fingers all splayed out like Vienna sausages on a picnic plate. Sybil's fingers were not so stubby, but they would be embarrassed if anybody called them dainty. Henri Matisse had vermilion under his fingernails. Sybil had burnt sienna on her forehead, cobalt blue in the creases of her elbows, Mars red in her hair. She had Naples yellow on the ample seat of her skirt and green earth on the soles of her feet. Gauguin liked his girls on the wild side. I think Sybil would have tickled his pickle if he was passing through town or she landed stranded on a desert island. After all, she once kissed Trudeau on the cheek. Or maybe he kissed her. Emily Carr worshipped in nature's cathedral. Sybil knelt before her own easel with rivers of sweat in her cleavage. Sweet pot smoke floated on the breeze of her breath. Her incense blessed the sunlight itself. She painted the trees, and then she painted the forest for the trees. Biblical Job had the patience of Job. Sybil did not. You may laugh now, but how much patience do any of us have? Art is made from equal measures of despair, adrenaline, and ecstasy. Job was a flat-out bore. How he got so famous, I'll never know. If you never had a feud with her, you probably weren't close enough for long enough. I propose a toast now to all of the feuds that tie us together. Artemisia Gentileschi beheaded, beheaded Holofernes. Sybil Goldstein pulled the thorn from the paw of a lion and taught her own Jacob to wrestle with angels until the wrestling became a jitterbug and their footsteps turned the earth into caramel butter. These streets took her steps into tribal places alive with ironic romance, but not yet filled up with our ghosts. Once, not that long ago, Sybil sat here and stared upward into the darkness. Then she punched a hole through this very ceiling so that the muses could watch over us and give us a place to dream. How many plots have been hatched here while we sat together, beer delirious, half crazy with what ifs, tapping our feet out of tune, our hearts beating in sync. Sybil sat under her own starry nights. She could swirl and twirl as good as Vincent did. She chased her own demons until she infected them with vaudeville and Rubens. And made them retreat obediently into the crooked cobwebs of her studio.
She dipped bitter herbs into salt water and rolled the memory into sweet cakes, and then she fed us. We have all been nomads in this business. So she carried those crooked cobwebs from place to place, along with half-crushed tubes of titanium white and minty toothpaste stuffed into the bottoms of banker's boxes overflowing with unsold sketches. There were so many paintings and such little time to pay the rent. George O'Keefe lived to be a hundred, give or take a few days. So did Doris McCarthy. Sybil did not. Pharaohs and queens were wrapped in linen and cinnamon oil. But Sybil stretched her own linens taut and anointed her brushes with terps and linseed. She taught these things to memorize her visions and then to repeat them whenever we cared to look. Her fingers and eyes were timelessly locked in a duet, a pas de deux in the, bell, in the ballroom of her imagination, until the night swallowed all darkness, the coffee pot ran out of steam, and the clock ran out of rhyme. Roses are red. Thank you.